Grace and peace be multiplied to each of you this morning in the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Lord. What a blessing it is to be at Southwestern this morning. I am grateful and thankful for the privilege to be with you. I want President Greenway to know in his absence that in covering him and covering you in believing prayer, asking God's great blessings on this school, grateful for the text-driven preaching conference and for Dr. Allen's gracious invitation to participate again this year and just to be here with all of you. If you would take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, let me breathe a prayer. And then there is just one verse I want to lift that is on my heart to share with you today. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we do thank you and praise you for every demonstration of your goodness, greatness, and graciousness toward us. We praise you for the Lord Jesus Christ above all, who is our all-sufficient prophet, priest, and king. And in his name, we pray now that you would open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things from your word. Give us understanding, and we will observe your word and keep it with our whole heart. Help me to speak your word faithfully and clearly. And as the seed of the word is planted and watered, we know that only you can give the increase. So we reserve for you, as always, the highest praise and full credit for the fruit that shall come from this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 6. And I would focus your attention on Verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Amen. I want to label the message simply first things first. More than 100 years ago, Charles Haddon Spurgeon began a sermon on Matthew 6, verse 33, by simply saying, there is just as much need for this utterance today as when it first fell from our Savior's lips. Indeed. These words fell from the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ more than 2,000 years ago. Yet these words are just as relevant as today's breaking news. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 13 says that we should exhort one another daily as long as it is called today so that no one may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. The world is so bad, sin is so great, we are so weak that we need to be exhorted to do right every day. If there is one exhortation we need every day, it is Matthew 6, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Of course, this verse is a part of the Sermon on the Mount of Jesus recorded in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. In this section of the sermon, Jesus teaches his followers simply to live without worry. The paragraph begins in verse 25 by saying, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? The word there, anxious, simply refers to care or concern. Depending on the context, it can refer to legitimate concern or to sinful anxiety. <laughs> Interestingly, legitimate concerns 
have a way of becoming sinful anxieties. To be anxious is to have a divided mind. One thought pulls in one direction, another thought pulls in the other direction. Hope pulls you one way, fear pulls you another way. You wish for the best and, and expect the worst at the same time. In fact, our English word worry is derived from a German word that means to choke or to strangle. And in the real sense, that's what worry is. It is internal strangulation at the ruthless hands of uncertain circumstances. But here Jesus says to all who will follow him, do not be anxious. Do not worry. In fact, the command here is forbidding something that is already taking place. Literally, Jesus says here, stop worrying. Stop worrying. In the 1980s, the first lady, Nancy Reagan, launched a campaign to keep kids off of drugs called Just Say No. It was a noble endeavor. It was largely a failure. And the reason is obvious. It is hard to say no if you don't have something better to say yes to. Anxiety is, is an addiction of the heart that, that we just can't break cold turkey and say no to. So in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Jesus gives us a remedy for worry, an antidote for anxiety, what to say yes to as we say no to worry. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. This verse is the key statement in this prohibition against worry. This verse in a real sense, is the golden verse of the Sermon on the Mount. This verse is the open secret to a blessed life, death, and eternity. I can state the point of the verse in three words. Put God first. Why should you put God first? You should put God first because God put you first. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19 says, We love because he first loved us. That's why we're still here. It's the reason why you were saved. It's the reason why we are still alive. God put us first. In Romans chapter 8, verse 29, Jesus is called the firstborn among many brethren. The only reason you and I are children of God is because God sent his only begotten son first. In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, calls Jesus the first fruits from among the dead. The first fruits was the first and finest of the harvest. It was advertisement. The first fruits, in a real sense, was a way of saying that if you think this is good, just wait. The best is yet to come. God in Christ put us first. And I want to challenge you today, friends, to put God first. How do you put God first? There are two clauses in this little verse, and I think they give us Two answers to that question. Simply, to put God first, you must A, seek God, B, trust God. First, the text exhorts us to seek God. There are three types of people. There are those who do not seek God. They don't know what real happiness is. There are those who seek God, but not first. 
They are the most miserable of people and don't know why, when in reality, there's a civil war going on in their hearts. And there are those who seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and they are the happiest people in the world. Do you want to be truly happy? Thomas Akempis gave the formula. He simply wrote, seek God, not happiness. Seek God. Seek God personally. I grew up with this verse in the King James Version that says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. Indeed, you cannot seek God for someone else. No one else can seek God for you. It's an individual and intimate matter. You must seek God for yourself. Jonathan Edwards wrote a series of resolutions to govern his life. The opening ones are most memorable. Number one, I will live for God. Number two, if no one else does, I still will. This is the first and foremost and fundamental principle for seeking God. There must be a personal resolve that is determined to seek God no matter what others say or do. In John 6, remember, Jesus miraculously fed a crowd and they would force him to be king until he began to preach about the cost of discipleship and they all scattered away. And he was left with the 12 he started with and he looked at them and said, are you leaving too? Peter answered in John 6, verses 68 and 69, Lord, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have come to know and believe that you are the Holy One of God. Friends, this is why I'm sticking with Jesus, not because he always does what I want him to do, the way I want him to do it, when I want him to do it. I'm sticking with Jesus because there's no better alternative. If you walk away from Jesus, where do you go? You must seek God personally. Secondly, seek God continually. Seek God continually. The grammar here is in an emphasis that denotes habitual activity or continual action. Keep seeking first the kingdom of God. The unsaved, the unbeliever may seek the benefits of God, but they do not seek God. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 and 11 says, There is none righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks after God. The good news is if we are not seeking God, God is seeking us. This is the mission statement of the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew, or rather Luke chapter 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. This is why Jesus came from heaven down to seek sinners and not to punish them, but to save them. In fact, if you are here, friend, and you have not trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, I plead with you today, surrender. Turn yourself in. Throw yourself on the mercy of God. Trust the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ that is alone mighty to save from the wrath of God that is sure to come. We are reminded here that salvation is not just an event. It's the beginning of a lifelong process of continuously, perpetuously, perpetually seeking God. In the Benedictine monasteries of medieval Europe, a new convert would be given a habit of simple cloth to note his new spiritual journey, but his quote-unquote street clothes, the clothes he came there with, were not discarded. They were left in the closet so that every morning he woke up, he would have to make a decision to continue in his new journey or to go back to his old ways. And in a real sense, every morning. God, by his mercy, wakes us up. We must make a fresh determination to seek God and not chase sin. 
Seek God. Personally, seek God continually. Seek God ultimately. Ultimately. It, it would be way cool if this weekend a friend of yours showed up at your house unannounced, knocked on the door, and when you open it, there he is with a, with a big, warm pan explaining, sorry I dropped by unannounced, but my wife just finished this cake and it smelled so good as the aroma filled the house, I thought about you. And I rushed in the car to bring it. I asked her to make me another one. I, I wanted you to have this cake. I was thinking about you. Yeah, I brought a fork just in case you wanted to share some, but this, this, this is for you. It would not be cool if that same friend showed up at your house and you opened the door and they got a little saucer with tinfoil on it and said, my wife just cooked this cake and it was smelling so good. I ate a piece and kept eating until I ate it all. But before I ate the last slice, I thought about you. Brought you this little piece before it's all gone. In a greater, deeper, higher way, I contend that God deserves the cake, not just the crumbs. You're to seek God ultimately. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God. And here first is not first in series or order or process. It is first in priority. Jesus is not merely saying, put, put God first and your family second and your education third. And your, no, no, no. He is saying God is to be the most important thing in your life. That is not to suggest that you should have no concern for the other areas of your life and the things that matter to you. It is to say that your commitment to God should shape and guide and govern every other area of your life. You're to seek God first in your family. Seek God first in your education. Seek God first in your ministry. Jesus bid a young man to follow him Luke 9, verses 59 and 60, and he says, sure, sure, Lord, I'll follow you, but first let me go bury my father. Jesus said, let the dead bury their own dead. You go proclaim the kingdom. Jesus was not in any way suggesting he should be disrespectful to his parents. He, he is, his issue is the word first. That passage is to remind us, brothers and sisters, the Lord will not take next in your life. He desires first place. He deserves first place. He demands first place in your life. Beware. If you think you're too young, to seek God or too proud to seek God or too busy to seek God or too happy or tired to seek God, too successful to seek God, too proud to seek God. It may be too late to seek God one day. Isaiah 55 verses 6 and 7 says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and, and let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him and to our God and he will abundantly pardon. I don't know what abundant pardon is, but I like the sound of it. <laughs> Seek God personally. Seek God continually. Seek God ultimately. Seek God sincerely. At this point, it's public domain that I was called to pastor my first church at the age of 17. What, what kind of is in sub public domain 
is that there was a small group that tried to put me out by the time I was 21 years old. Uh, th these, these leaders were trying to put me out, and I wasn't worried about it. I just, it wasn't nothing to worry about. I knew they would succeed. <laughs> I was just waiting for the other shoe to drop. <laughs> And I remember one morning, I got a phone call from a pastor in the city. He still pastors in the city. And he just called to check on me. He said I, he didn't want to be on the inevitable list of people who were in my face when things were going good, but disappeared now that things were going bad. And using Matthew 6.33, he encouraged me to hang in there. Everything was going to be all right. And I told him, yeah, but I haven't been perfect in this situation. I believe I'm right, but I'm not perfect. I, I'm, a, I'm a young pastor. I've made some mistakes. I haven't handled everything the way I should. And maybe this is just me getting what I deserve. He said, HB, I think you misunderstood Matthew 6, verse 33. It doesn't say you have to be a perfect citizen. It says you got to be seeking the kingdom. He was right. This verse is not a call to sinless perfection. It is a call to sincere devotion. And sincere devotion simply means that you seek God on his terms, not yours. What are God's terms? Jesus says, but seek first the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. It's not geographic territory. It's sovereign authority. Matthew 6, 10, Jesus teaches us to pray. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. To be a citizen of God's kingdom is to be submissive to God's will. Then seek his righteousness. Righteousness, conformity to the revealed will of God. To, to be righteous is to be right with God. Matthew 5, verse 6, Jesus says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be fully satisfied. This point, I believe, is true. It's not books that change our lives. It's often sentences. In this book, he's God and we're not. Ray Pritchard simply says, what you seek, you find. I constantly wrestle with that sentence. What you seek, you find. Do you know what that means? It means right now, brother, right now, sister, you are as close to God as you want to be. If the promises of God stand true, that if you hunger and thirst for righteousness, you will be satisfied. It means if you are not closer to God, it means you don't really want to be. Your prayer life is as strong as you want it to be. Your walk with God is as strong as you want it to be. Because if you are seeking his righteousness, hungering and thirsting for it, he will satisfy it every time. In fact, Jeremiah 29 verse 13, the Lord says, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with your whole heart. Seek God personally, seek God continually, seek God ultimately, seek God sincerely, and seek God practically. Practically. I love the little prayer song, Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. But the truth is, if I really want to be a Christian, it won't just be in my heart, it'll be obvious in the way I live. In fact, there are three independent, external, objective indicators of my devotion to God, my time, my money, and my relationships. Seek God first in your time, beginning every day in prayer and reading and meditating on his word. And begin every week by being marked present 
in corporate worship on the Lord's Day. The old man, blind, barely could hear, never missed church. And when somebody asked him, why do you come every Sunday? He simply answered, I just want everybody to know what side I'm on. <laughs> Hallelujah. Put God first in your time. Put God first in your money. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10 says, Honor the Lord with your possessions, with the first fruits of all of your increase. And your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with wine. And then seek God first in your relationships. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 makes it clear. Bad company corrupts good character. I'll give you a simple way to spot a person who is seeking God. The one who is seeking God usually hangs out with others who are seeking God. Seek him first in your relationships, or as Jesus says, a new commandment I give you that you love one another. As I have loved you, so you also should love one another. And by this will all men know that you are my disciples you love one another. How do you put God first? The first answer in this verse is this, seek God. The second answer in the verse is this, trust God. The verse begins with a divine command, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It ends with a divine promise and all these things will be added to you. Warren Worsby is right. God's people live on promises, not explanations. We don't live on explanations. We live on promises. And somebody here knows you can live on a promise for a long time if you trust the one who made the promise. This is God's guarantee. If you put God first, he'll take care of everything else. That's God's affirmative action program. That's God's bailout program. That's God's faith-based initiative. That's God's social security system. That's God's stimulus package. Just put me first and I'll take care of everything else. It's a matter of faith and it's a matter of focus. So let me ask you those two questions. First, where is your faith? Look at verse 31. Jesus again says, therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? He gives two reasons why in verse 32, for the Gentiles seek after all these things. The nations, the heathens, the pagans, the, the world, the unbelievers seek after these things. Sinful anxiety is functional atheism. People that don't have a God on their side have to worry about what tomorrow is going to bring. But the bottom of verse 32 says, your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. Every need in your life is a part of the, the compassionate omniscience of God. In fact, Matthew 6, verse 8 says that the Father in heaven knows what you need even before you ask. In fact, ask is important here. In a real sense, to trust God is to pray instead of worry. If you, if, you, if you are really seeking God, prayer will be your first response, not your last resort. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. 
It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. A young missionary had a long assignment in a di distant land. A friend, somewhat wealthy, accompanied him to the ship, and as they departed, the wealthy friend handed the missionary a sealed envelope. He said, what is this? He said, just don't worry about it. For now, in, if you get on your journey and have a need that arises that, that cannot be met, open up the envelope then. Twelve years later, the missionary returned from his assignment, and again, his wealthy friend was there to greet him at the ship. And after they embraced, the missionary reached into his satchel and pulled out the envelope and handed it to his friend, wait for it, still unsealed, and testified, I never had a need that the Lord didn't meet. <laughs> Hallelujah. Where is your faith? One more question. Where is your focus? My first formal preaching professor, James Bohr, made a statement in passing during a talk that I have never forgotten. He simply said that you never find happiness by looking for it. You stumble over it on the pathway to duty. In a real sense, this is what Jesus is saying here. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added, literally placed alongside of you. you you'll never... Get your needs met by focusing on your needs. But if you seek God first, by the time you look up, he will provide what you need. Solomon was given a blank check by God. Ask me for whatever you want. Solomon did not ask for fame, wealth, power, he asked for wisdom, an understanding heart to do God's will as he led God's people. God gave him all the other stuff he didn't even ask for. Indeed, if you put God first, he'll take care of everything else. No, this is not a promise of prosperity. It is a promise that God will meet your need. God will meet your needs. I was, I was shocked reading some commentators almost apologizing for this verse, suggesting that it, it's a, a reference to mutual generosity. God will meet your needs by somebody stepping in and providing for you among the fellowship of believers. Sure, God blesses us to make us a blessing, but this is not a promise of mere mutual generosity. It's a promise of divine generosity. God will meet your need. If you seek God, you can trust God. If you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these other things will be added to you. Or if I could say it the way I like to say it, if you take care of God's business, God will take care of your business. Stillman Martin was an itinerant evangelist. He and his wife, Sevilla, would travel, preach. She would play and sing often before he preached. And they spent an extended period at a small Bible college to help them formulate a hymnal to use in their chapel services. During their time there, Stillman had a preaching engagement some far distance away, but when he woke up that morning, his wife was sick, and he determined not to go. She insisted that he go. 
and they debated back and forth. And, and their young son overheard the parents debate and stuck his nose in grown folks' business and said, Daddy, if it is God's will for you to preach today, don't you think he'll take care of mama while you are away? Chastised by his son's question, he did go preach, and while he was away, God did take care of mama. Her strength was restored. She cleaned up the house. She prepared a dinner for his return, and over the course of these uh, hours, words started to formulate in her mind on the basis of her son's question. When Stillman finally arrived home, she was eager to show him the words she had written, and he was so moved by them that he immediately set them to music. And more than 100 years later, the church still sings, be not dismayed, whatever be tied. God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. Through days of toil, when heart does fail, God will take care of you. When, when dangers fierce your path assail, God will take care of you. This is my verse. Whatever may be your test, God will take care of you. Lean, weary one, upon his breast, for God will take care of you. I need to quit. I hear David saying, let me get the last word. <laughs> David says, I was young, but now I'm old. And in all these years, I've seen a lot, but there's something I've never seen. I have never seen the righteous forsaken by the Lord. And I've never seen his seed begging bread. If you seek God above everything, you can trust God in everything. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for its truth, its wisdom, its authority. Thank you for the holy command of the Lord Jesus that would bid us to live out the life of the teachings of our faith with sincere devotion, unconditional surrender, and steadfast determination to please you. Help us not to worry about the consequences. Help us not to be anxious about our needs. Help us not to be fearful about tomorrow. I pray that for the leaders of this school. I pray that for some young student. I pray that for some minister in a difficult season. Help us to trust you with all of our heart and not lean on our own understanding acknowledge you in all of our ways that you may direct our path. In Jesus' name, amen.